I'm not asking if you believe in it, but was there any experience that stood out the most that was most proof worthy or is it just the fact that it's so regular and it kind of so common that makes it more susceptible to knowing that it's real? Is that too much of a weird ass? I ask that weirdly. No, it's not. I've had some proof worthy experiences, but it's interesting. Julie and I have talked about this before that, you know, when people are visioning, we don't have a whole lot of conversation with them about what's happening. We just kind of watch what's unfolding. We don't really get in the way of that. We see, so we don't, we're not like, who are you seeing? What are they telling you? And I did, I did have a couple of experiences like that, which were the ones that really affirmed to me that people see what they're saying that they're seeing. Um, but we, we witness it a lot, but it's kind of so commonplace in a way that it's not, I, I don't know, it's not as profound each time we see it or, you know, it's very profound, of course, but, um, you know, like I've only had a handful of experiences where my patient told me what they were seeing because most of the time when they were doing it, I just observed what and knew that that's what was happening. I didn't like press them for who they were talking to because I had already seen that with other patients where they said, you know, my wife is in the corner. I see her. She's right there. She's coming to get me, you know, like, I've had those. So, so many of the times when we see these visions, we just, it's just a sign that we see, or we ask the family, have you, have they been seeing these things? Are they saying there's the, it's kind of like, are, are they, are they having irregular breathing? Uh, how has their blood pressure been? Are they seeing dead people? You know, it's like a symptom of dying in a way. So after a while, it's like, I don't know, it's, it's always profound, but it's less, I don't know, Julie. Oh, no, I was, uh, I, that's exactly how I was going to say it too, Penny. Like, so to me, what's, what's most fascinating about it and what I found is that like how often, how often it happens. And like what I, I can't say whether I really don't care what it is, but what I, what I liked, like, so it's like, I don't care. Like, do you believe in it or not? It's like, I believe in it. I know that it's not the things people think it is, right? It's not oxygen being, or the brain being deprived of oxygen. It's not because of medications. It's not delirium. That looks much different. Like I, I can say that this visioning thing that we see in a lot of hospice patients is its own thing. I do know that it's not like, I really don't think it's because of medications or because of, well, I definitely, it's definitely not because of the oxygen to the brain, because most of the time they're alert and oriented and their oxygen's fine. So it's mm -hmm. more like, I know what it's not but I don't know what it is. And to me, it happens just often enough that it's like, it's kind of commonplace and it's not about us, right? As hospice workers. So it would be very, I would think it'd be very strange for a hospice nurse to be like, tell me more. What is it? When did they die? Yes. Like yeah. that, that, that's weird. Like, like <laughs> nurses shouldn't be doing that. Right. Like there's, this is like, uh, this is more of like, it's not about us. It's about their experience, about the family's experience. Mm -hmm. And yes, I've seen people visioning and it's, of course, like Penny said, it's always amazing, but I'm not going to like interrupt that to like get a good yeah. story about someone visioning. You know what I mean? It's more exactly. like, just observe and, and you, uh, and it's more surprising to me how often you observe it. And really, if you don't observe it, a lot of my stories come secondhand from family members because they're worried. Like, I don't necessarily see someone visioning, right. but family will say, Hey, I'm getting worried because he keeps talking to his dead dad, you know? And then that's where you do the education. Um, so yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so an example of that for me is, and I, and that's one of the things I asked as a, a hospice case manager, um, or even when I worked in facilities, which it was more evident then because you would see them doing it. But like as a case manager, I would ask my patients, have you been seeing anything out of the ordinary? Because it is a sign to us that people are approaching the end of their life. It can happen two, three weeks before their death. Like Julie said, they can be completely cognizant and verbal. They're not taking medications. And so it's a question I would ask, but I wouldn't dive into what they were talking about. So like uh, one of my patients, 
Uh, I knew she was failing. She always still wanted to sit at the kitchen table with me and she would barely make it in there. She had lung cancer. And I, I asked her one day, have you been seeing anything out of the ordinary? And she said, like, what? And I said, well, like visions of maybe dead people that aren't here anymore. And she said, oh, no, no, nothing like that. And I said, oh, OK, because that's normal. And she said, it is. And I said, yes, that's normal. We see that all the time. And she goes, oh, well, then I'll tell you, my dad is standing in the kitchen. Oh and, 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 uh, <laughs> and I was like, oh, OK. You know, and that was it. I didn't say, what does he look like? What is yeah. he wearing? Did he say anything to you? How does he look? Is he young? Is he old? You know, yeah. like I just said, oh, yeah. OK. You know, like, great. Validated her that she saw him. I also feel like if we start pressuring them about what they're seeing, it may feel invalidating in a way, yeah. in a way. like we don't believe what what they're telling us but but I also have had the same situation as Julie where uh, you know people have called me and said hey I think they need some medication they're seeing things you know they're well what kind of things are they seeing well she keeps saying her cat is in the room and her cat's dead died 20 years ago oh okay well that's really normal you know comforting to them we don't need to medicate that away it's normal but I, I love the way you put it, Julie, like it's it's not our experience, it's their experience. And we're just, we're assessing for that experience. So we know where they're at in their dying process. But that's the extent right there. We don't need to, we don't need to play into it. We don't need right. to, you know, like if they say, I'm looking for my cat. Well, let me help you find it. You know, we don't need to do that. You know, we just accept yeah, and, uh, and obviously you're validating where they're at with too. it. So it was clear yeah. she obviously saw someone, her father, and then needed you to validate it, and that was all you had to do, and that was it. And then you played you, you played your role perfectly. Damn, hospice is just exactly. perfect. I mean, yeah. I know I spoke right. to y'all already, but every time I speak to you, y'all, every time I speak to you two, it's just it's just uh I don't know. I don't know. You guys, you guys cover so many different <laughs> aspects of life and it's, it's making me think of, I just had a uh, episode. I'll get y'all out, you two out of here soon. And, um, I spoke to this guy, uncle Jack, he's a hundred, hundred years old. And so just related to me in regards to you speaking to people that are on their deathbed and at the end of their life where I don't know how personal you two get with your patients. I'm sure it varies maybe from patient to patient, uh, and not to put you on the spot, but I'm putting you on the spot with, if there's anything you recollect in regards to patients that have been the most profound to you, whether it was just something about the way they lived their life or anything that stood out to you just orally with their words? You know, most of the time I, I and I, I see, <laughs> I actually did a video one time calling out somebody who said, if I would have known, if they would have told me in nursing school, how many people make deathbed confessions, I would have thought twice about being a nurse. And I was like, I've never heard a deathbed confession because I'm not a chaplain. I'm a nurse. That's not my role. I'm not there to get their confessions. I, I think for me, I mostly hear about my patients' lives from their families. Usually when the person is dying, that's when the family starts to reminisce and they talk about their person and I hear these things about them. And, um, you know, and, and, and I can't think of anything that really stands. I, I can recall patients that I've had where, oh, she was a nurse at Harborview or, you know, she was an amazing photographer and there's all these pictures of Africa in the room and, you know, little things like that. But I can't think of anything that was so incredibly out of the ordinary that it mm -hmm. stayed with me. You know, I, I remember lots of my patients and how the family loved that person and told me the special things about them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I never wrote them down. And I, <laughs> you know, I, I never heard any deathbed confessions or anything like that. Um so, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I think, I mean, definitely um, a few patients like stand out in my mind where I can like visually picture them and their families and things about them and probably stood out because of our connection. You know, you're not, you're not close with like, of course, like you take care of all of your patients, but certain patients you like click with more, the families you click with more, or they live longer. So you're there more often, or they have more issues. So you're there more often. It just depends. And there's certain, um, patients that stand out in that way to me, just in a special way because of having to care for them. And I would say mostly the ones that really stand out that I like to tell stories about are like the the like what I was mentioning earlier with like the love. Like there's certain like there's a family right now I can think of. I can, I don't know the patient's name. I saw them twice, but like I will forever 
remembered this story because it was so profound in the sense of like, I went to go visit him and he quickly changed on a dime. Like, like he was not, he was dying, but he wasn't like actively dying. But for some reason, whatever happened in that visit, he went to actively dying. And that could have turned into panic fest. The family, like all the family was there. Like they could have freaked out and, and, and not been in the moment. But for some reason, they were able to take what I was saying and just turn it and just turn to what needed to be done, which was nothing, <laughs> and just be there with this with their loved one, saying everything they wanted to say, surrounding this person with love, like a big cocoon of love. And it profoundly changed me to be able, and, and I, I'm like, I want to be like that. I want to be able to switch into this mode of like, we did not know he was going to die today, and now he is. And he died there with me there. And the family was all around. And there's no wrong or right way to grieve, right? But like, um, but to be able to do that and to switch on a dime, like things like that. Like I have multiple stories like that, right? With different people. And those are the things that I remember and the people that I remember. Even if I don't remember their names, I remember like the feelings that we all felt, the, the fact that I was there when he took his last breath and everyone was so amazing in that moment. It really transformed the whole moment. 